this morning. Our lesson is standing up for Jesus and our faith. Um, I hope you don't think my lesson this morning is a negative one, because I don't mean it to be a negative one at all. I'm going to talk about something that none of us like to really talk about, but it is a fact, a reality facing each one of us in the church. Hopefully that you have noticed by now that the devil is hard at work in our society. I really hope you've noticed that. Because he's working on you, he's working on me, he's working on everyone. He is using his various wiles and schemes to reach deep into our inner person, our inner being, and trying to indoctrinate us into thinking just the opposite of what God wants us to think. That's what's really happening in this world today. And I hope you realize that. It's a battle. And when I say our, I'm not just saying our here in the church. I'm talking about everyone, not just us in the church. It's everywhere we turn. We are hearing these messages. We are seeing others giving these messages from what seems to be every direction. Trying to convince us that what is wrong is right. And what is right is is wrong. We are being inundated with this message. It reminds me of Isaiah back in Isaiah's day in the Old Testament, chapter 5 and verse 20. This is what Isaiah said through inspiration of God. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Can you make application of that in your life? With something you have heard, something you have seen this last week, just this last week? If you can't, let me give you some examples. Gender bending. Multiple genders. If you don't know one, or if you don't know what you are, then create one for yourself. And I'm not just talking about homosexuals. I'm talking about ecosexuals and all these other kinds. You just create one yourself. There's more than one gender. That's the message of the devil. And it's everywhere you turn. According to the Bible, Genesis 1, the Bible that I believe to be the word of God. There are only two genders, male and female. We are trying to be taught that same-sex marriage is acceptable, and if we don't accept it and agree with it, we are homophobic. There's something wrong with us. And we need to be schooled. We need to be retaught. Here's another one. Race relations. Pitting races against races. One race against another. One color against another. It's everywhere we turn. And the messages are subtle. From what I read in the Bible, there is no color in the church. Galatians chapter 3, 28 and 29. There is no race but the human race. Genesis chapter 1. The most important race for us as Christians is the Christian race, which we are running and trying to finish acceptably before God. That's the race we need to be concerned with. One more. Equal rights. Equal rights for all. Pinning male and females against each other. One's bad, one's good. As far as I know from what the Bible said, the golden rule applies to everyone. Luke 6, 31. As you would have men do to you, you do to them. That's what the Bible teaches, but that's not what we're hearing. Anywhere, we're not hearing that. These messages are coming out in our society which are against God and His will. They're often subtle messages. 
Did I just hear what I think I heard? And they do and will affect our thinking if we are not careful. Brethren, they're affecting our thinking in the church. And they're affecting our relationships with others in the church. And we need to be careful at the messages we're hearing from without because it's affecting us. Jesus says, Matthew 6, 32, or 6, 22 and 23, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Who and what are our eyes set on? What are we looking at? What are we gazing at with interest? We need to be careful. What are we allowing into our body through our eyeballs? Because <laughs> it's getting in there. I don't know of any of us that are blind. Maybe we'd be close to it. <laughs> you know, but none of us are blind. We got to be careful. Those little eyeballs are important. Jesus told us right here. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, lying, wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. That sounds like our day today. Because they did not receive a love for the truth, love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth that had pleasure in unrighteousness. Brethren, who has our ear? Who has our ears that we're listening so closely to? Who are we listening to? We need to be careful. We need to listen and to believe the truth, God's Word. Give God our eyes. Give God our ears. We have a love for the truth. And we will soon be called to defend that truth, it appears. For some in our congregation, we have already been called to take a stand for Jesus and the truth. This is serious. <laughs> And it's going to be on us. It, it, it is already on us, folks. It is already on us. Let me tell you a story. This, this couple, within the last couple of weeks, in our high schools here in Merced, one particular high school, there was a teacher. This teacher was teaching his class on one of the big subjects, math, reading, social studies, and science. Those are the four babies. It was one of those four. And this teacher had his classroom, and there was a student in that classroom. And the teacher, for some odd reason, decided to show a sexually explicit video to his class that had sexual innuendo all over it. There was one God-fearing student in that class that stood up to the teacher and said, this is inappropriate. I'm not going to sit here and watch this video. And the teacher said, then get out. This is a true story. Happened in our town. Then get out. Get your stuff and go outside. So this student got up, started packing his school bag, put his book away, and was heading through the door. And the teacher thought, well, he's right. I'm going to get in trouble. So he said, come back. I won't show it. I won't show it. So the student went back and sat down. And then the phone rang. And the teacher didn't know that that student's parent was in the front office getting ready to take that student to a doctor's for him. He didn't know what was going on in the class at all to their child. The teacher must have assumed that that student got on the phone and called his parent or their parent. 
and told him what was going on. That's what he assumed. And so he said, okay, call the student's name, get you back, they need you up in the office. So the student got up, the same student got up, packed his bag again, and was heading to the door, and the teacher said, everybody, let's all boo this student as they go out the classroom. And all the students and the teacher booed this student out the door. Because that student stood up to the teacher and the teacher assumed that he was being called out because of what happened. That student was one of our members. That student that went through that is sitting in this room. Thank God for that Amen. student. It's honest, folks. There's been others that have had to stand up for the truth in the last week also. The time is swiftly approaching and may be nearer than you think when we are going to be called to take a stand for Jesus and our faith for what we believe and how we live. To do that, to take that stand, we are going to need four things. First, we are going to need a strong faith. Strong faith. Not just faith, but a strong faith. You know, we know a lot about faith. We talk about it all the time. We put things up on our wall that talk about faith. Faith comes by hearing. We know about faith cognitively. We know Hebrews 11.1. 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We can quote it. We know Hebrews 11.6. Uh, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We know cognitively that Jesus came to this world and did many things, signs and wonders, so that we could have eternal life. John 20, 30, 31. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Most of us in this room have stood up before others and made that great confession. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But do we have the kind of faith that saves? The kind of faith that really believes that every single word in the word of God is the absolute truth. And that we are willing to stand before others and defend it. Do we have that kind of faith? Jesus said in John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Can we put our faith into action when it comes to defending it? You have your Bibles. I want to read 1 Peter 3, 13 through 17 again. Jake did a wonderful job. And I told Mary when I read it, when I heard it read by Jake, this is the perfect scripture for this lesson. 1 Peter 3, 13 through 17. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. You are blessed, teenager, because you were ridiculed in public before your peers and made to look stupid for defending your faith. Blessed are you. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason uh, for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, as was done to one of our members, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed, 
Shame on that teacher. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for good, doing good, than doing evil. Boy, that scripture fits. You tell me it's not relevant to this world, to this time, the Bible is relevant. Is our faith growing stronger and stronger each passing year? When times get tougher for us as Christians, and they will, and they are, and the pressure is put on us, will our faith collapse, or will we stand firm? To get through the tough times ahead, we are going to need a strong faith. Number two, we're going to need courage. There are many examples in the New Testament of disciples of Jesus who had great courage. They stood firm. In Acts chapter 5, verse 22 through 42, a lengthy passage. Many of us remember it. Paul and the other apostles were commanded by the council to stop preaching the gospel in Jerusalem. They beat them and they sent them away. And they went right back to preaching the gospel. <laughs> why? The text tells us why. We ought to obey God rather than man. That's courage. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen stood before the high priest, the elders and the scribes, and faithfully preached the gospel. And they got so angry, they ripped their robes and they picked up stones and they killed him. But he stood strong because he had a strong faith and he had great courage. And he died right there. In Acts chapter 11, Peter stands before the brethren in the church in Jerusalem and defends his action of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles in the conversion of Cornelius and his household. He had courage to defend the faith, God's will, by standing before his own brethren and saying, I did this because it's God's will. And that took courage. Sometimes it takes courage to stand in front of our own brethren and do the right thing. We could go on and on talking about our faith and our and bre faithful brethren over time in the first century who courageously stood before the opposition and proclaimed the gospel. We didn't even talk about Paul or Silas or Barnabas or Timothy or Titus, Priscilla and Aquila, not to mention all the others that are in extra-biblical literature. That means writings of the first century that are not inspired from God, which talk about Polycarp and countless others of our brothers and sisters in Christ who suffered terrible, torturous deaths for the cause of Christ. This week I read a little bit from Fox's Christian Martyrs of the World. It's scary, folks. It's scary to see what our brethren went through and the torturous deaths they suffered because they did not forsake Jesus. <clears throat> and we may be put to that same test someday. How are they able to have great courage like this? The Bible tells us, 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love. Perfect, perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been perfected in love. They had a great love for the Lord. 1 John 5, 4 through 5. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is, uh, who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. God has not given us a spirit of fear, brethren, of timidity. 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. If we are going to stand for the Lord when tough times come, we are going to need courage. And God supplies us with that courage. Number three, we are going to need virtue. This is an interesting one. Many times we think of virtue as being moral excellence, which it is. But it's much more than just moral excellence. In other words, living a righteous life. It's much more a life. 
living a righteous life. It's much more than that. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 5. We're familiar with this. It's add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, and so forth, the Christian graces. But, and most of us are familiar with this. We're to add to that faith virtue and possess it along with the other characteristics if we are to make our calling and election sure and never stumble. He says to add virtue, but it's much more than moral excellence. This word carries with it the idea of strong determination. I am going to do everything in my power to be morally excellent no matter what. No matter what. We are going to need that virtue to stand up and defend Jesus, defend his word, and defend our belief and how we live, no matter what they do to us. We're going to need virtue, brethren. No matter how tough the going gets, I am determined to do God's word. My point is this, in order for us, to take a stand and defend the truth, defend our faith, defend why we live the way we live, we are going to have to have virtue. The determination to do God's will no matter what. When the times, tough times come our way, when we are singled out, like our member here was singled out of the group for our beliefs in Jesus, for how we live our lives according to the scripture, we need virtue to stand strong. We're going to need strong determination. You look at those we just talked about who courageously stood for Jesus to the point of death. They all had a strong faith. They had courage. And they had a strong sense of virtue. Do we have it too? We are going to need number four, fellowship. Think about it. Probably all of us have been through tough times before when we've had to take a stand for what is right. Wasn't it a nice thing to have someone to share that story with? Someone we could talk to that gave us encouragement, that gave us moral support, that we could bend their ear we could know we did the right thing. Wasn't it good to have that? That is what fellowship is all about. Many times, those supporters have been through similar situations. Some of them literally and were able to lift us up. This is important. If we have no one to talk to, to share our values and our beliefs, it is even tougher to take a stand if we don't have anybody to talk to who believes like we do, it's going to be really, really tough. We're all in this together. When you were baptized into Christ, you dedicated your life to the Lord. And you committed yourself to the Lord. But as part of fellowship with God in Christ, you also committed to them and to me. And I'm committed to them. And I'm committed to you. And we have to help each other. We have to stand side by side with each other. Going back to Acts chapter 4 for a second. We see this principle in action with Peter and John. This is before they all were beaten and told not to do that. This is the chapter before. And they were warned not to preach the gospel and warned not to perform any more miracles in the name of Jesus. And you know what they did? They left that room and went out and found the brethren. And they told them all about it. And they all praised God together. And they went right back out and did the very same thing. But the point I want to make is... They left that room after being warned and they went to the brethren to share 
What had happened to them? And they all praised God for being warned not to do it. That's fellowship. Fellowship. Look at it this way. As to why fellowship with the saints with each other is so important. You'll have to forget my stick figures. I have to give Jose credit for this. We talked about this one time when we were talking together. We wrote it down right there on a piece of yellow paper. I said, man, this is a good illustration, Jose. Let's take a minute and write it down. Because we're talking about this very thing. You and me are in the middle with the big ears. And I put big ears on that in honor of Phil Fredericks. <laughs> but you see the point. If there are so many people in the world, if we have more fellowship with the world of people in the world, and they have our ears, and we're listening more to them, and they're just bombarding us with all these voices, and then over here we have a few people that we fellowship with at church, brethren. Who's going to win out? What are the chances of us making it through? If all we ever hear is the thousands and thousands of people that don't know God and they're telling us how we should live our life. Whose voices are heard the most? It's the world. Now look at this one. This is the better way. When we're in fellowship with the brethren and we're in contact with them and talking with them and sharing and things like that, and we hear voices of the world but not too many, we're better off. Amen. We're better off listening to our brethren. We're better off listening to God's word. If this is the way we're at, we stand a better chance of standing strong when the tough times come our way. Thank you, Jose. If we are going to stand true and faithful to the Lord when tough times come our way, we need all the fellowship we can get with God and Christ and each other. We're going to need fellowship if we're going to stand tough because they're coming for us. Satan is hard at work in this life. The time is coming and now is for us to take a stand for our faith and for God and Jesus. In truth, we are going through tough times from time to time even now. And we need all of these now. But times may get a lot tougher for us in the future if they haven't already. Are you prepared for the rough road ahead? Rough road ahead, folks, is coming our way. I was hoping it would in my lifetime, but I don't think I'm going to get. I'm going to make it unless I something happens. But I'm not counting on it. But I need to be ready. Nonetheless, I need to be ready. Are you ready for the rough road ahead? Is your faith strong? Do you have the courage to take that stand no matter what? And I'm telling you what, when that happens, when you have to take a stand, and many of us know this already, you just, it really does something to your body inside. You're put on the spot. <laughs> Am I going to do this? I know what I need to do. Am I going to do this? I'm going to do this. And you do it. And it's not easy. Some of us know that. Do you have the virtue to stand true no matter if they boo you out of the building and embarrass you in front of your friends? Is your fellowship with God and Christ and your brethren strong? Is it really strong? Or is it just take or leave it? Our families are good, but our brethren are better. We have to be with each other. We're going to make it. We have to stand together. Our eternal life may depend on our answers to these questions. Are we ready? Are we ready? If you're here today and you're a Christian and you're not ready, you know, if that persecution were to come through those doors right now, you would have a problem because you're not ready. Then I hope you're ready to go to God in prayer and ask
ask him to make you ready. Ask him to give you these things that you need to stand strong for the Lord. Stand up for Jesus. Because it may come in your lifetime and mine. Repent and rededicate your life to the Lord and catch that fire. The fire that Stephen and all those others had that we mentioned in the first century. They lived there during that time. Get that fire that they had and be strong. Be strong for the Lord. Rededicate your life to Him this morning. If you're here this morning, you're not a Christian. Jesus came and died for you. Like Larry was saying this morning, He came to die for you so that you can live the better life. We memorialize that suffering that Jesus went through. He stood strong. He had all of these things. And He was victorious, resurrected from the grave is with his Father in heaven now. And he wants you to enjoy that with him someday. Obey the gospel. Follow after Jesus. Believing that he is the Son of God. Repent of your old way of life and turn and follow after him. Confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Put Christ on in baptism. Be clothed with Christ. And live for him to the best of your ability to the day you die. In fellowship with God and Christ and with us. If you're here this morning need to be baptized, obey the gospel. We encourage you to come forward. We're going to sing a song of invitation right now. I asked him to lead it all again. Stand up. Stand up for Jesus. So let's begin to stand up for Jesus today by standing up and singing this song like we believe it. And we're dedicated to do it. Won't you come if you need to come? <laughs>